Hello everyone and welcome back to the Ochuck Biz Show. We're Silicon Valley's first business podcast for teens, hosted by a teen. I'm Sachin Sal. I'm a 17-year-old award-winning entrepreneur and podcaster from the Bay Area, and I interview remarkable and influential entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and inspiring individuals from all walks of life so we can learn from their stories and level up ourselves. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of 3 doshascom a lifestyle coaching platform transforming lives through 3 doshas energies from yoga and Ayurveda. The purpose of the show is to inspire you to go for it, which is what Ochakte means. Also, Ochakte is a Punjabi word and it means go for it. And that's the whole purpose of the show because I want to inspire you guys. So thank you for clicking on this video. This is our special guest right here, Eric Vaughn, uh, co-founder and general partner of the Hustle Fund, a VC fund that invests in founders at the pre-seed stage. Before Hustle Fund, Eric spent his career as a product leader and a startup founder. A fun fact about Eric is that he has over 61,000 followers on X, and he has thousands more of other followers on all other social media platforms. So welcome to the Other the Show. Thanks for inviting me to your uh, garage studio. I love this place. Super excited and happy to be here. Yeah. Um, what's new and exciting? Well, what's new and exciting is uh, that you're here because uh, I think you're the very first guest I've ever had in this garage. Uh, That's good to know. I've been working here for six years, and rarely does it do anyone want to hang out in a you know, kind of a sketchy, dark garage like this, but we're making it happen to have this conversation. It's uh, really exciting for you to be here, and I'm just pumped about this opportunity to speak with you. Hey guys, I want to talk about something about my mentor and friend who you may know, Lloyd Lobo, because I actually interviewed him on the show. He released a book that became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. The book is From Grassroots to Greatness, 13 Rules to Build Iconic Brands with Community-Led Growth. He's curated wisdom from both the big brands and hyper-growth startups, including Apple, Atlassian, CrossFit, Harley Davidson, HubSpot, Nike, Red Bull, and many more to teach you to build an audience and turn it into a community and movement. Uh, I personally find all the art and like the design and format on this book super catchy. I think we're gonna learn from the graphic design that was used in here and how Lloyd and his team were able to make this a masterpiece. Um, there's a quote by Lloyd that I really like. It goes, um, yesterday's innovation becomes tomorrow's commodity. But if you build a community, you won't become a commodity. So think about that. That's that's spot on. I really love that quote. Um, if you want to get a copy, you can go to from grassroots to greatness.com or just go to Amazon and search up from grassroots to greatness. Enjoy the episode, guys. Awesome, same here. I know a bunch of people probably, probably already asked you this one, but it says it on your ex, says it on your LinkedIn minivan enthusiast. What does that mean? Yeah, so maybe you, you I'm not sure. Actually, did your family ever have like a minivan? Yeah. Like, at point? <laughs> okay, great. You know, um, it started off as a bit of a joke many years ago. Uh, around that time when I had my first son, um, we got our minivan and there's all these fun kind of, playful attacks at me from like my buddies who are just like saying like this is like not a masculine thing or it's uh you know you've, you've given up on life you're driving a minivan and all that stuff but here's the deal <laughs> minivans are actually pretty terrific they got these doors that slide on the side right so if you're going to be in a busy parking lot or dropping off the kids they're kind of clutch huge capacity and i can't think of anything more masculine than driving a minivan because it usually means that there are children you have helped to create <laughs> that exists that's in the true. back seats, right? So uh, for me, it's like this counter narrative that's become a bit of a longer term meme of uh, my just really pro promoting minivans a lot as like these pretty amazing lifestyle cars. Uh, I love mine. Mine's parked outside the garage, our Honda Odyssey. Uh, it's silly, but now I can never get rid of the minivan because it's so on brand. So it's like a personal brand now. It is. Because I've seen other people like, oh, Eric, the minivan is this, minivan is this. So you have to just stick with them. I guess you still, you love them, right? So I do, but it's also maybe one lesson too in terms of this game as a venture capitalist. So VCs just generally look all the same. Like go to the website, go to like the backgrounds. I mean, it's like mostly white or Asian men in Silicon Valley, even today. So being able to embrace a little bit of weird, I think is a, an advantage to sort of differentiate yourself. And if you're a minivan dad out there, I just, I think it comes associated with like, hopefully someone that has more of like an avuncular personality, a little bit more wholesome. And, and I do think that's pretty authentic to me. So yeah, I'm a proud uh, minivan owner and driver for the time being. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so can you tell us, can you, I'm a teenager, I'm 17. Can you bring us back to when you were a teenager? What were your teen years like? Where were you, like what location were you? And then also like, what were you passionate about? 
I sh yeah, I mean, I sure as hell wasn't doing impressive stuff like this, Sachin. Uh, so I was born and raised in Detroit, um, oh, in Michigan, and then uh, had a great childhood there. I grew up in a fairly homogenous part of Michigan, though, on the western side. And uh, so, you know, great childhood. Michigan was a little bit boring for me. Uh, felt a little bit out of place being one of the few Asian people, too, in that community as well. But, um, you know, my parents, I guess as immigrants, uh, really encouraged my sister and I to just dream really big, focus on school. And I knew very early that I wanted to leave the state to explore something different. So that's actually how I got to California was to attend college out here. And that's been, that was 23 years ago. Stanford, right? Yeah, Stanford. And I've never looked back. I mean, in my very first day of college, I met my wife. First day of college? Uh, yeah, she didn't. I didn't know she was gonna be my wife either. She wait, sucked. wait, tell me more about that. How <laughs> the first day? How does so it's actually within like even the first hour of college. So yeah. I'm moving into the dorm room. Okay. And then uh, this is a co-ed dorm. So my neighbor to the right of me, uh, you know, I just knock on the door, and then open the, the person opening the door ha happens to be my wife. So uh, she was dating some other guy at the time. She was, um, and you know, I had to wait three years for that to sort of wrap up. Okay. And then of course I just uh, swooped in the moment that I heard that she was single and never let go. So that was 20 years ago when we started the date. I met her 23 years ago and I'm married for 14 now. That's amazing. I yeah. just saw your kids there. Yeah, yeah, you saw my, my babies uh, in there. They were greeting <laughs> Sachin and his mom uh, when you walked in, so that's cool. Yeah, um, so can you, Simply explain what exactly the hustle fund does and for someone that doesn't even know what a fund is or VC Yeah, that type of stuff that complete yeah. beginners that are watching to learn. Can you explain what everything is? Yeah, so I'm a venture capitalist So the role of a venture capitalist is somewhat simple at a high level Which is you know you as a person who is managing uh, other people's money usually these are the money that represents large institutions Possibly some very wealthy families or high net worth individuals, mm -hmm. maybe even governments uh, you raise that capital and then uh, you're expected as a venture capitalist to steward that money and to invest it well And the category that we invest in is early stage venture capital firms or, uh, or venture backable firms So these are promising startup companies building cool software in some cases other funds invest in hardware or crypto and other things like that And if these businesses are still promising we invest a little bit of money and the companies just do their work the founders leverage their talent to grow big businesses and when the IPO or get acquired by Google or something like that, we all make a lot of money. So uh, that's what Hustle Fund essentially does is just this focus on early stage venture, venture backable founders. But our mission is to democratize wealth through startups by providing capital, knowledge and network. So money is one part of it. Knowledge is uh, we actually are as much a media company now as we are a VC fund with a scaled uh, newsletter, YouTube channels, events. Yeah. And then network, uh, when Sachin decides to uh, start his company, we don't assume necessarily that you come from a position of privilege where you know thousands of like potential buyers or things like that. We have that kind of network and we try mm -hmm. to open that up to new founders as well. And uh, it's a pretty fun mission, fun team that we're running now at this point. That's amazing. I, I love Hustle Fund. The website's also really nice. Uh -huh, sure. Um, why did you choose to invest in like early stage and people that are like early in the game that are just hustling instead of people that are more established? Well, for a few reasons. One is way more fun. So there's okay. something kind of special about being one of the first investors into a company. Normally at that point, there's not that much data or information and the founders even have their own imposter syndrome that they're trying to overcome of like, can I actually make this happen? Yeah, you provide a little bit of capital, but the thing that makes this game so satisfying is when you can bear witness to founders who kind of reach that moment of self-actualization where they realize that, oh my gosh, it's working this. Oh my gosh, I'm the right kind of leader for this thing. And then they take off. It doesn't happen every time. Only a minority of companies that you ever invest in as an early investor will actually have that kind of breakout moment where they could pot potentially be the next Google or Facebook or something. But when it does happen on those rare occasions, it's something that's amazing to witness. And the other thing too that you can't deny in being an early investor is that if you do your job right, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, like some of the early investors at Uber had 10,000, 20,000 X outcomes. So like, you know, that's, that's an unfathomable amount of money uh, that can be made. Lots of risks, so lots of failures possible. But in the cases where you can be rewarded by investing well, it can be enormously lucrative for everyone. Yes, yeah, so I saw also on your LinkedIn that you started and sold companies yourself. Yeah. You got, you got a company, two companies acquired, right? One by the Daily Mail, one by Jib Jab. Yeah. Three actually, but yeah, so uh, this is my fifth company, if you want to call it, call it Hustle Fund, uh, a company too. 
And yeah, I built most of my career building media businesses myself. So how do you think that's helped you? Like, okay, so why did you choose to become a VC after starting and selling companies? Well, being a builder is great and it's a ton of fun, but I gotta say that I developed a little bit of toxic habits, I guess, out of being a founder. So one of the realities of, of starting something from scratch, especially if it's a high ambition kind of business, is that it takes a real big toll on your mental health. Uh, you're putting almost all your resources and time normally behind a single company and over time your identity kind of meshes a little bit sometimes with the project so on good days you're feeling great on bad days you're feeling terrible the reality of being a startup founder is that it's usually bad days you know the good days are fewer than the the bad days and uh and you know in, in the case of how i did my companies i put like all my money all my time behind it so it's pretty stressful when you're down to your last like 250 dollars in your bank account and you're like how am i going to survive this period which happened to me a few times so um, the great thing about being a VC is uh, two things. One is there's great product market fit. Mm -hmm. Turns out that founders really like taking money from VCs, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Every company I started, I had to search for three to five years to figure out if the market really wanted what I, what I was making. And the second thing too is just like, because it's a portfolio of companies, the stress is actually a little bit more even. Uh, it's always terrible when the founder has to shut down, but it's actually okay because you only need a few of those companies to really, really break out to be a successful VC. So at this age in my life, I'm 42, I got my young family. Um, it's just a little bit better to mentally compartmentalize this job yeah. personally as a VC. And of course it's still a lot of fun being so close to these enormously talented folks. That's, you have a great life. I mean, <laughs> you know, Thanks. it's just, Honorable stuff, commendable stuff. And I think VC people have truly changed founders' lives. And like, the entrepreneurs start a company and they're helping people solve and they're solving problems. And then you have a VC who's helping them in the back. It's just a good combination. Yeah, although I kind of want to switch the order of that to some degree, right? Like the as a VC, uh, you can take this job to be quite lazy. At the end of the day, you know what am I doing besides giving capital and providing a couple introductions? And then, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the hard work is actually done by the founders, right? So one of the things I kind of wanted to change in terms of the VC narrative as, as part of being one of the co-founders of Hustle Fund was mm -hmm. <clears throat> moving it from this thing where founders feel like they're serving their VCs because that's how it felt when I was a founder. It's like, I gotta like serve these dudes who are giving me money. Never felt great. And switching it from VC serving their founders. Like I would love VC awesome. eventually awesome. to be almost like a payroll provider or like a banking partner or, or a benefits partner. Like, just another one of that service stack that serves founders and allows them to get unblocked because the reality is just like they're creating all the value and I'm almost creating nothing compared to them. I saw on your LinkedIn, your highlighted video where you talked about the three reasons why you should take an investment plus one. Can you quickly tell those three to my audience? Yeah, I hope I can remember it though. <laughs> so uh, there's a few things. One is, uh, I think I do remember it. Uh, we try to make our decisions really quick. Yeah. Oh. So uh, we have an unusual investment model where we start with a fast $50,000 check. So last month we saw over a thousand companies. We wrote checks in about seven businesses with an initial $50,000 check level. And we paste about seven new investments per month. And the idea is like, if we're curious about the company, we want to learn more about the market, let's go ahead and write a very fast check. The next part is uh, in the way that we actually help founders. Like we like to help on customer acquisition and sales and growth. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole school on all this stuff. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really light lift, but we pair you up with uh, a really awesome network uh, as well uh, as, as part of that experience to help you grow your company. Uh, that's one of our biggest value adds. Um, the third one I'm kind of forgetting here. Was it like network or something? Was it? Network and then also because you got to give people into a nice community. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So network, we kind of talked talk about this earlier, but capital knowledge and network. So the network part of it is, um, you know, we, we know thousands of people in this industry just being practitioners and founders ourselves for so many years across our team. So we can, we're generally one warm intro away from anyone and, and helping to facilitate those key conversations is a big part of it. And then the last part is we call the vibes. So like, um, VC can, can feel like a very cold industry sometimes. People think about that. But for some reason, whenever someone thinks of VC, venture capital, it's a cold and like this is pure business. You gotta, don't get don't get screwed, don't do this, do that. Make sure you're like, and people get stressed out. But when I looked at also fun, it's so different from all other ones. Yeah, we're a little more playful. And like, it does, like when I was raising money, it felt like I was pitching a bunch of Caesars. We were like, <laughs> Sachin's like, nope, goodbye. Or like, yes, like come in. And it was, it was super annoying and clinical and, and soulless. And then, uh, if you go to our website, hustlefund.vc, you're going to see that it kind of feels a little different. Like 
Our official uh, mascot is the Hippocorn. It's called Dunkey. Her name is Dunkey. It's like a hippo with a unicorn uh, horn <laughs> and then Pegasus wings. It's a bestseller, by the way, on our store, <laughs> ironically. Mom, when my mom came here in the car, she's like, oh, did you see Eric's logo? I'm like, yes, the buffalo right? She's like, I love it. Yeah, yeah, the Hippocorn. So anyway, like, we do things like that. If you look at our copy, it's like something like our... One of our lines is like our newsletter is so good you'll be farting rainbows because like actually the hippocone yeah. farts a lot of rainbows as part of the thing it's anyway, logo, right? the big yeah it is so like we, <laughs> we like it because like um one is authentic to us in terms of our juvenile voice but the second is just uh you know if you're going to work with us we, we also want to have like a lot of fun yeah. and and solving for fun is usually comes down to one thing one is we're working with people with very high emotional intelligence and mm -hmm. self-awareness so like these kinds of conversations can feel very safe <clears throat> and the second is just like um, that it's, it's likable on both sides because when you invest in a company early uh, It's like a seven to ten year journey before your business is actually gonna IPO yeah. So like it's kind of nice if we can like each other too along that way and just the reality is we're gonna grow old together If you're gonna sign up for this. Can you remind me how many years you've been doing the hustle for? Uh, we're in our sixth year right now. What yeah. do you think has been one of like the, the best moments the best times in the entire journey? Uh, I mean, it's, it's been a really amazing journey, the whole thing. I think the reason why is just uh, how we think about talent even on our team. So I have a, after when I started Hustle Fund, it was like 35 at the time, I had a little bit of success as a founder. And I knew that like with like some bare minimum financial independence and freedom to do what I want to do for, the, for, for my career, I just wanted to solve for joy. So solving for joy was very simple for me. It's just like surround myself all the time with people whom I respect so much are really amazing at execution and uh, are also just uh, really high EQ individuals too. So that includes my investors, that includes my founders, but really critically are the 30 teammates I get to have at Hustle Fund who are such good human beings. So I just wake up, go down to the garage, uh, do a little bit of work during the day. Uh, usually I'm here for a long time actually, but um, it's, it's really a joyful work because I'm just largely just surrounding myself with excellent people all the time. And as part of that was like, I decided I never want to put on an affect ever again. Here's what I mean by that session, which is like earlier in your career it can sometimes feel like you want to put on a persona okay. of like yeah. someone that is like this kind of founder or this kind of product manager, maybe not it's like a little bit less authentic to yourself, but like you're kind of like projecting a bit as an insecure young man. Like I felt like that, but here, like I wear sweatpants every day. Like I, I, I just I'm unshaven all the time. Like I'm, I'm just uh, myself in the garage. I don't hide my backgrounds ever backgrounds right so it feels uh that people can get to know me a little bit more too and they either don't like it but usually they do like it because like a little bit of vulnerability begets more vulnerability back so it's a comfortable space to be i love it it's really nice the inspiring stuff um do you want to talk about any like particular investments you're really excited about at the moment or some so cool company you're working with right now there's so many <laughs> <laughs> i mean like i'll start with uh one of my favorites company called forage so there's, a, there's a, a, a government program called EBT, which is more commonly known as food stamps. And I grew up with uh, a lot of families, including my wife uh, also and her, her journey, um, uh, who, who had to be supported by EBT with food stamps. Problem with that is that the government hands you this uh, little card that you can use at the grocery store. And um, it's a little bit of an undignified process. Uh, you know, you can't buy all the items. You know, sometimes you get rejected and it holds up the line. Everyone can see your EBT card and you have to be physically present. So there's certain stores that allow you to use EBT for certain products and then you go to another store for other products and so forth. It's just a, a waste of time. So what Forge does is they are a third party payment processor that allows any online grocer to use your food stamps. Oh, awesome. And even though like that might be a more expensive way of buying groceries, think about this. Like some of these families, the parents have like three jobs each. They have no time or energy to do grocery shopping. Or they might even live like in Detroit in a food desert where the nearest grocery store is like 15 miles away, right? So DoorDash, uh, Instacart, these kinds of services are actually really critical for feeding families. Uh, and that convenience is definitely like worth the trade off on any kind of markup on the, on the product. So uh, it's amazing journey, great team, um, and serving a really great mission because there's so many families that are food insecure in America and it's just helping all those families get, get food on the table. That's awesome. I know if you go on the website and go to portfolio, you can see all the companies, right? Really a lot of them on there, them. yeah. So Yeah, I, I kept going down to see more. Really. We have so, nearly 500 companies in nice. our portfolio, so it's, it's a big list, yeah. Awesome. So it's called The Hustle Fund. 
hustle is hustle. Yeah, what, what not do you hustle think? fun, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hustle. Yeah. What do you think is the definition of the right hustler that you would invest in? Hustle is really easily defined for me. It's great execution meets high velocity. Mm. So hustle actually has is a funny word because like we've played with this term quite a bit over time. In the 90s, a hustler was almost like a drug dealer or someone like performing like illegal behavior. Yeah. Like Notorious B.I.G. would talk about like how he was hustling drugs on the corner to feed his baby daughter uh, in that awesome 1993 song, Juicy. Highly recommend it. Um, so like there's some of that. There was actually like a porno mag called Hustler. <laughs> also like yeah, even before exactly. that, it still exists, I think. But then like um, there's also now more modern permutations of hustle. like. There's this constant concept of like hustle porn, not actual pornography, just this idea that you work yourself to death, putting all these hours in the office. Yeah. Our view was just like, you know, hustle has been traditionally tied to like weird toxic masculinity and I think a, a kind of like negative traits, but we kind of want to re-own the word. Uh, we're one of the few female-led funds in the United States. Only 5% of US funds are actually run by women. We're actually one of them. So my two co-founders are women, more than 50% of our team is women. So to be a hustler, uh, it's kind of interesting already to play with like the gender aspects of like we're w mostly women that are saying this. But the second thing too is like, I don't believe this notion that you have to work yourself to death. Like hustle, great execution is high velocity means for whatever hour of input that you put into your job, you're getting extraordinary output. It means working smarter, yeah. being much more intentional for how you are spending your time. And you could be putting in 40 hours a week as, as like a regular founder which doesn't sound that loud in the context of a regular job, but producing an output that's crazy high. And some of our best founders just exhibit that all the time in their lives. They have balance in their lives, but they're producing incredible work. So great execution meets high velocity. That's the, that's the term that we're now trying to espouse with, with hustle. Awesome. Yeah, I love the word. Everyone talks about it in podcasting and media and entrepreneurship. Oh, we got to hustle, man. Do you hustle? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. It's really nice. Um, I saw online on your LinkedIn you stated that Hustle Fund is your last job. Yeah. Um, why did you make the decision and what does it mean to you? Well, I guess uh, earlier in my career, I kind of like felt like I was rushing towards something, which is like in my 20s, I was like, it'd be great if I became like a millionaire someday or, or whatever, or like, uh, or even like your, your peers now, perhaps even yourself. Like when you get to college, like all these people are dreaming of like dropping out to like get their funding and get going in their company and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, the older I get, the more I'm kind of looking back at younger Eric and I'm just like, what was the rush? Right? Like, I mean, you got to sort of just, instead of like racing towards the destination, just enjoy this journey a little bit more. And so the way that that manifests at Hustle Fund is just like, I'm trying to hire for people who also are open to the idea that this could be their last jobs too. Um, approaching it in a way where like I am just viewing this as like a very very long-term thing in terms of the relationships I'm forming within the team the founders my investors over 20 30 years and then um, yeah I mean just like I'm not polishing my resume for the next thing anymore this is it you know nice, I'm nice. here in this garage for the yeah. next 20 30 years that could be hell or heaven depending on who you are yeah um, do, as we wrap up here these are the last two questions that I asked all my guests um, the first one is what's your best advice for teens my best advice for teens, okay, so uh, something that I figured out in my 20s that you can definitely apply now even, especially if for some of you who are, might be approaching college, like whatever, whenever you're young, which is this idea that you can, while you're young, cold outreach almost anyone, especially while you're a student, and get a very warm <laughs> response, which is how this that's, works. That's how this happened. happened. Yeah. yeah, so this podcast is actually like breaking the fourth wall here. This podcast is actually really clever because like, you know, um, Sachin somehow has like hustled his way into literally my house <laughs> and we're spending like an hour together, yeah. you know, uh, and we'll have this relationship and this anchoring in our relationship forever. So um, don't be afraid to do a lot of cold outreach. And then the way that I sort of structure it is like, it could be quick. The question that I used to ask was like, like, hey, I'm trying to build like really, really good mental models of what excellence looks like. You are VP of sales at this company and I could just want to learn about your journey or you're a product manager here, or you're a VC, whatever it is, like they're kind of curious about learning. And see if like people will take you up on a 30 minute conversation, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then the idea there is like, don't sell yourself. Like just listen, ask lots of, be very present, ask lots of those kinds of questions, try to understand it, and then keep in touch with these folks over time. I do an annual uh, newsletter every year to my network, to like 8,000 people all at once on Christmas day, about like just what I'm up to, and I want to hear their updates as well. It just keeps my network at scale warm. I've, Hold those 8,000 people together over the course of like 10 years 
of just like lots and lots of cold outreach, trying to get two, three meetings a week at least, all right? And it does work and it will add up to a lot. And the reason why this is important is at some point you might be thinking, I want to get a new job. For people like Sachin who is building like this great network, he's not going to apply. He's just going to talk to the decision maker and be like, can you create a job for me? And it will work. So that is, I think, the way to sort of really protect your career is through like this amazing network you create. Curate. And it's easier to do that when you're younger because people just like to talk to young people. I totally agree. Um, maybe I should call myself a cold email enthusiast. Yeah, <laughs> like, very good at this. Yeah, um, I just love it. I mean, all, all nearly all the, actually everybody on my show that have all the successful entrepreneurs is just either cold email or cold calling them. Yeah. They say yes. And they're nice. If you have a, if your personal branding is good and you are you warm when you reach out to them? It'll most likely happen to happen to you right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. Um, so last question of the day, what was your favorite part of being on this show? Favorite part is actually having you as my first external guest into the garage. <laughs> this is amazing, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, it is not necessarily designed as like a studio space at yeah, all, yeah. but I can't think of a, a better first guest to have uh, than spend time like this and also to get to know you because... Uh, Man, these, these habits that you've sort of figured out in building like this media business, mm -hmm. talking to the folks to grow your network, um, just like a, being an early investor, uh, it, it's kind of fun to get to know people before they self-actualize into the greatness that you're destined to become. So I'm having one of these moments right now. I'm just like, good Lord, this guy's going to go very far. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And yeah, now I can brag and say like, oh, I met him when he was 17 <laughs> in the garage. Amazing, right? Yeah, well, it's people like you that help me grow the show. So I appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for inviting me here. Guys, make sure to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you guys next time. Let's do it. Thank you.